Hello, hello, good morning, or, well, it's good morning for me, it would be good afternoon for you guys, good evening, whatever. Um, thanks for playing this video. Um, I don't know whether you've missed class or any other reason, but I'm glad you're getting all these notes because this one's an important one, guys. We are starting period three, which is very, very critical for our AP World History curriculum. So guys, we have been in class for two and a half months now, and we are actually 50% through with our curriculum, which is pretty cool, all right? But period three is a little bit different, and I'm gonna tell you guys about that in just a second. Okay, guys, so as I said, today is our first class for period three. Um, what you might notice is that Period three is actually the shortest time frame that we've looked at. So you, get, you guys might remember that period one is 1200 to 1450. That's 250 years. And period two was 1450 to 1750. And that is 300 years. All right. So period three is 1750 to 1900. It's only 150 years. So you'd think that it might be a little bit shorter, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> period three is really, really important. And we're going to get a little bit more in detail than we have in the previous period one and period two. Okay. Um, we are setting up for kind of how the world looks today in 2020. And we, the best way to start is to talk about unit five, these revolutions. Okay. So unlike period two, we will be going in order for period three. So we're starting with unit five. Um, which is revolutions. And in unit six, we are talking about the consequences of industrialization. So revolutions will lead, lead to industrialization. And then we spend a whole unit talking about the consequences of this. And I'm not going to lie, guys, unit six is probably my favorite um, unit in all of AP world history. Okay, so um, we'll get there, though. Today is basically an introductory lesson. So we're gonna talk, um, we're gonna do an intro to period three and what this means for you guys and what this means for your AP World History curriculum. And then we're gonna start with topic 5.1, which is the Enlightenment. Now we're gonna just look kind of like a, at a broad overview of what the Enlightenment is. Um, it's a very, very important intellectual movement that really sets the stage for revolutions um, and industrialization and the consequences of that. But let me get to that in just a second. So you guys have seen this chart a few times in this class, but I like to start each period by showing it to you guys again. Um, just as a reminder, period one, unit one and unit two, 1200 to 1450, um, really only gonna be between 16 and 20% of your exam weight when you take the exam in May, okay? Still very important, still need to know, but the real sort of meat and potatoes of AP world history is both period two and period three. So we've already talked about period two. We talked about our land-based empires and our maritime-based empires. And guys, that's about 24 to 30% of your exam waiting, okay? So you guys are all experts on that. Um, you can tell me everything I needed to know about the Columbian Exchange y'all did great on that, okay? But the other major component of AP world history is period three. And as I said, it's my favorite, especially unit six. Um, it's also the shortest time frame. So 1750 to 1900, it's only about 150 years. But a lot of really big stuff happens in this time frame, okay? We see the enlightenment, we see a ton of revolutions, we see industrialization, we see Europe getting more and more powerful, okay? And we see the consequences of Europe getting more and more powerful, okay? What that's gonna mean for the rest of the world. All right, we will talk about all of our favorite regions. We'll still talk about East Asia. We'll still talk about the Islamic states. We'll continue to talk about Africa, but we'll talk about them a little bit different than how we did in period one and period two. Because guys, period three is gonna be Europe's golden age, okay? Europe's going to have a lot of power and Europe's going to do a lot of damage to the rest of the world. And we need to figure out how and why, okay? So 
please, please, please write this down, guys. Um, again, I'm giving you an overview of period three today, but as I said, period th three is really important. Um, you're gonna get a lot of questions on your AP World History about period three. And we are gonna go a little bit more in depth in this period. So in period one, I gave you your G Persia charts for each of your world regions. So we gave you kind of like an odd, um, a broad overview of these world regions, of these cultures, um, of what was going on with the maritime-based empires, land-based empires. But now we're gonna get a little deeper in the material. All right, we need to get a little bit more detail-oriented, okay? Not super duper detail-oriented. You're still not gonna have to know dates and times and um, places, but you are gonna have to know a little bit more information than you would have had to know when we talked about period one and period two. And that's good, guys, because we are moving along in our course. All right, you should know some more um, information, okay? So period three has the most information in the shortest time span. Like I said, it's only 150 years, but they are a very important 150 years. All right, you're gonna see Europe um, consolidate power. You're gonna see Europe um, begin to try and resource hoard and continue to take over other areas of the world. You're also gonna see industrialization. You're gonna see um, that change in continuity in where luxury goods are coming from. So not so much out of Asia anymore. Um, after industrialization, Europe is gonna be able to um, be kind of the primary you know, manufacturing place in the world, which will be followed by America as well, okay? The major themes you will see um, across all three periods, well, excuse me, across period two and period three are gonna be the same, right? Europeans will still control global trade routes through their maritime-based empires. So um, the Europeans will still control that Indian Ocean trading route with their trading post empires. They'll also still continue to control um, the new world um, briefly, briefly, eventually from after revolutions will have different um, levels of control. But in the beginning of period three, the Europeans will still be very, very powerful um, and they'll continue to grow more and more powerful, okay? Populations are still gonna grow, okay? The Colombian exchange is going to be a major component of how populations across the world are growing. Now, I know a lot of you were probably surprised when I said that, you know, despite all of the smallpox, despite all of the enslaved people trade, um, populations in Africa and the new world are going to continue to grow. They're going to grow in China, they're gonna grow in Europe, and this is because of new food, okay? Um, one continuity is that much of the world regions are still going to practice the religions from earlier periods. So you're still going to see um, Christianity is still practiced heavily in Europe. Um, Hinduism will be practiced in South Asia. Um, Islam will be practiced in the Middle East. China will still practice Confucianism and Taoism. Um, yeah, so you will see this kind of continuity in religions but you'll also start to see some more and more global religions. So as we said in period two, Christianity is the world's first truly global religion, and that will stay the same in period three, okay? So we're gonna talk a lot more about change and continuity, that historical thinking skill that you guys all love. Um, so keep, these, keep, keep this in mind for when you write your LEQs and your DBQs, because remember, you need to know those historical thinking skills. So similarity and difference, change and continuity, and cause and effect. And so keep these three in mind as we discuss the difference between period two and period three. Okay guys, so this is just sort of an overview of what we'll be talking about in period three. Um, it will be the first time that we talk about the United States of America, okay? Um, in period two, we just briefly talked about them as a colony of Great Britain. Um, we're gonna, I think our next class, we're gonna be talking about the American Revolution, okay? We'll also be talking about more components of the British Empire. So Canada, parts of Africa, Oceania, and eventually India, which is a sad story to tell, all right? We'll be talking about Russia this time as well. Um, that will be a new revolution we'll talk about towards the end of period three. We'll still be talking about Qing China, and the Tokugawa shogunate in Japan, all right? 
um, the Dutch Empire in Indonesia, which we've talked about before, uh, the French Empire in Africa, and other areas, okay? We'll be talking about some new players as well, all right? We'll be talking about the Congo, which we, we talked about as a slave holding region. Um, they eventually become a colony of a tiny little European state called Belgium. So we'll be talking about them as well, okay? Um, so all of these people down here, they will become part of our AP world history story. So I wanted to show you this map just as kind of an introduction to what we will be discussing in period three. Okay, so we are talking about the first topic in unit five, and that is called the Enlightenment. Before we can get to the Enlightenment, we need to talk about political revolutions. So what is a political revolution? Guys, it is an, kind of obvious. It's when we overthrow a political system. So we haven't really seen any revolutions up to this point in class. Um, we've seen kind of something similar. So when we talked about China, we said that the dynasties, when they lost the mandate of heaven, they were overthrown. And that's true. Um, it is kind of a political revolution, um, but it's more of a social revolution. So a political revolution is a little bit different. So what you're going to see in period three is that not just one area of the world, but multiple areas of the world are going to actively start to try to change their systems. Okay. They're not going to be happy with the political systems. They're not going to be happy with absolutism or um, mercantilism. Um, they're not going to be happy with the way that mother countries are ruling over them and they are going to uprise against them. So they will be actively trying to change the political, economic, and social systems. So again, the political system, kind of like absolute monarchies, economic system like mercantilism, and social systems like feudalism. So keep these three things in mind because political revolutions will usually be based on political, economic, or social systems. And the truth is, guys, these revolutions that we look at in this class often tend to get violent, okay? Blood in the streets, heads being chopped off, um, violent, okay? So this is going to be a little bit different than what we've talked about. We really haven't talked about any sort of violent, violent revolutions, right? We've talked about dynasties getting overthrown, but we haven't talked about emperors getting their heads chopped off in the street, okay? Eventually, people are going to get to the point where they just can't handle it anymore. And the only way to overcome this is through violent ending. So all of this is going to start in Europe, okay? So remember, period one, Europe, sad, fragmented, dark ages. Period two, they're going to get more and more powerful. And in period three, they're going to be much more powerful. But people are going to be a little fed up with the way that the governments are run, okay? And Europeans will start to challenge their own government systems. And all of these revolutions are going to owe their start in something called the Enlightenment. Okay? So what is the Enlightenment? Essentially, it's an intellectual movement. Okay? All of a sudden, people are getting around and talking about what's good in society and what's bad in society. They're going to coffee shops and they're sitting around discussing with their, their, their fellows um, about what, trying to understand the traditional relationships between government and people and social structures and people, okay? They're starting to question the, 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 the way their societies are built, okay? So essentially that is what the Enlightenment is. is people are just educated enough now that they're beginning to have this, these critical thinking skills. They're starting to wonder, hey, is this really the best way we can have a government? Is this really the best way to offer, you know, equality and justice to people? Okay. And essentially they're going to question whether or not um, absolutism or, you know, powerful monarchies should be the ones in charge. Okay. So they're also going to develop new political idea ideas. So before this, remember, Europe is operating under a system of feudalism. So you had your classic social hierarchy where you had the king at the top, the lords, and the peasants or the serfs at the bottom, okay? Now, people are starting to question this. Is this really right? 
is this a fair system? Should you be stuck in this cycle of being a few, uh, being a serf just because your parents were? All right, you can never really overcome this system. So people are starting to question individual rights. All right, do you have a right to your own education? Do you have a right to uh, freedom of speech? Do you have a right to vote? Okay, and they're starting to talk about natural rights. So a natural right is essentially something that is a right that is ordained within you. Okay, it's something that you are given naturally from whatever God you believe in. Okay, and they're also talking about something called the social contract. And we will talk about this in just a second. It's a very interesting concept. But I wanted to explain to you the pictures. So on the pictures on this slide are really interesting. Um, I went to Google to type in enlightenment. Every picture that I came up with looked kind of like this. So a bunch of men kind of sitting around talking. And I know that it might not seem that important. You know, you guys go to coffee shops all the time and you talk about how difficult AP world is or you talk about how difficult geometry is. But that is what the enlightenment essentially is. It's this time where men, usually in the middle class or upper class, are starting to get together and they're starting to talk about their ideas. And they're starting to talking about what they could do to make society better, okay? To make things more equitable, okay? Now, let me be clear. These people right here in this, this painting, they are not serfs, they are not peasants. The enlightenment doesn't begin at the very bottom. It, it kind of begins at the very top. So make sure you understand this. So let's talk about this social contract, all right? It's very, very important, and I really, really like this picture. So I would, I would, if I, I would write it down if I were you guys. So the co social contract theory, um, it is a theory, and it's, it's a little bit nebulous, actually. It's not um, concrete in the slightest. So it's this idea that power is given by individuals to the state. So this is the very opposite of absolutism. So you guys probably remember from a week or two ago when I told you about absolutism, which is basically that divine right of kings. So if you are the king of France, it is because God has chosen you to be the king of France. All right, you have that divine right ordained to you by God. Okay, well, the social contract theory rejects that, all right? Instead, the social contract theory says that the good of the people, okay? The s French citizens have given the French king the right to rule, not God, okay? The British citizens have given the British king the right to rule, not God, okay? Now, the social contract is basically this. The people have given their right, the right to rule to the king. So he has to be a good king, okay? Or they can remove the social contract. Does anyone think this sounds a little bit like the mandate of heaven? Yeah, it's a little bit like the mandate of heaven. It's not quite the same. Um, just because the idea is that uh, the mandate of heaven is essentially that um, the celestial being has, is the one that offers the mandate whereas the social contract is given by the people. But both have stipulations for when it is removed. So the social contract can be removed from the king if he does a crappy job, all right? So if the king misuses the power, the people can replace or overthrow him. So I wanna talk a little bit about this cartoon because I think it's very helpful. So you have the social contract, and this is a contract, all right? you know, very, very important contract between the government and the people, okay? The people give the government power as long as they protect their rights, okay? Their rights to own land, their rights to be free, um, whatever their society has chosen as their rights, okay? But the problem is, guys, is if the government misuses its power, if it overtaxes people, you know, or if it's not, a, it's not good, um, lots of tragedy, a lot of bad things happen, the people can replace or overthrow the government. So this is not the divine theory, okay? Only in divine right theory, only God could replace the king at that point, okay? The social contract is uniquely held between the king 
and the citizens, okay? There's no God or no religion associated with it, okay? So let's, let's talk a little bit more about this enlightenment. I keep talking about rights, guys. Um, now, everything we've learned up till now has not even talked about rights. If you're born a serf, you will die a serf. If you're born a peasant, you will die a peasant, okay? All of a sudden, the enlightenment, all of these people getting together to talk about things, about bettering society, and all of a sudden, people are starting to talk about this idea of rights. Now, you guys, as Americans in 2020, you know about rights, all right? You have the right of free speech. You have the right of freedom of religion, all right? Freedom to petition, freedom to gather, okay? You know, you have the right to own a firearm, all right? You have other, you have tons of rights. But before the enlightenment, no one doesn't has any rights, okay? There's no, there's no sort of um, codified rights written down on a document somewhere explaining to people what they can and cannot do. At this point, or prior to the enlightenment, it's really just all up to the king to decide what his subjects can and cannot do. But enlightenment philosophers, so again, those, those men in the coffee shops, they're going to attempt to do the following. They're going to try to increase rights, all right? They're going to try to expand suffrage. So you guys probably know that suffrage is the right to vote. And I know it's kind of a funny word. So if you ever, the easiest way to remember it is suffering is the right to vote. Um, they're also going to try to end slavery, all right? Um, you guys might have heard the word abolition. So the Enlightenment will start to question the institution of slavery. And eventually this will lead to the end of slavery, okay? They're also going to end serfdom. So again, if you're born a peasant, you have to die a peasant. And that's just not fair, all right? You should have more rights than that. So guys, one example of an Enlightenment document is the United States Constitution. And we're gonna talk lots about that in the next class. But I thought it would be a good way to kind of associate rights. Because um, I don't think people really understand what a right is, okay? Again, the US Constitution tells us what we can and cannot do, okay? The Enlightenment is also going to be a challenge to patriarchy. So this is going to be a, um, one of our details on change and continuity. So before I talk about um, this challenge to patriarchy, I do want to make, take the opportunity to explain what feminism is. Now, I know in 2020, um, some of you guys might think feminism is a dirty word, um, and it's not. Um, the actual definition of feminism is gender equality. It's not women are better than men or women should have more rights than men. It's not what feminism is. Feminism simply asks for gender equality. So all the rights that men have, women should have equal rights, okay? So early feminism, okay? And there's lots of different waves of feminism, but early feminism is also going to grow out of this enlightenment. So you probably did not see any women in those coffee shops talking about natural rights with their husbands, but they're at home and they're listening to their husbands talk about all this natural, these natural rights that men should have. And women are starting to have these, these appreciations for these natural rights as well. And they're starting to question um, why they, ought, they have zero rights, all right? Why, you know, they're nothing more than wives and they have no rights more than their husbands. All right, so you're gonna, we're gonna talk about this in the coming days. Early feminism will also be a symptom of the enlightenment, okay? So feminists are going to demand quite a few different things. First, they're going to ask for women's suffrage. So again, they're going to ask for the right to vote. Now, they're not gonna get it for quite a while, but they're gonna ask for it. And just the, the fact that they're asking for it or they're trying to get women's suffrage is going to be a challenge to patriarchy. So remember guys, patriarchy is that rule, the men rule, okay? And the fact that women are now suddenly kind of overstepping their gender roles, you know, coming outside of the house, outside of their role as a mother, a wife and mother, to ask for the right to vote is a challenge to patriarchy itself, 
Okay, they're also going to challenge gender based hierarchies. So remember the gender based hierarchy, men at the top, men are usually the breadwinners who work hard to feed and take care of their family and women don't have the rights. They're usually wives and mothers and nothing more. Well, they're going to challenge this. Okay, and we're going to talk more about this soon. So we need to talk about something called the cycles of revolution. So in this class, we are going to talk about four different revolutions. Okay, we'll talk about the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, and the Latin American Revolutions. But one thing you need to know about them is that except for one, okay, three out of four go through this thing called the cycles of revolution. And essentially, they all have the same cycle. Okay. Now, the Enlightenment is a good thing, no doubt. But the revolutions they lead to are not always good. Okay. Um, or they start off good, but then they, they tend to get very violent and very ugly. So when we talk about cycles of revolution, we're talking about an eight step process. And you see this process over and over again, except for one of the revolutions. Okay. That will be the American revolution, which we'll talk about shortly. So step one, let's think about those pictures of those coffee shops again. All right. Educated wealthy elites and upper middle class people want increased political power. So they're sitting around in coffee shops and they're discussing natural rights. All right. They're discussing, they're challenging that absolutism. They're, they're questioning whether or not God has ordained a king and they're coming up with the social contract theory. They're talking about um, the kinds of power that they should have as citizens. All right. And it's kind of a privilege in many ways. It's upper middle class, like white men who decide that they should have this privilege to challenge um, the way that the, the country is ruled. Okay. Let me be clear that these coffee shop um, discussions about the Enlightenment, they're not interested in radical social or economic reforms. They're not interested in equality um, for serfs. They're not interested in completely changing the mercantilist society. Okay, they're only interested in gaining a little bit of more political power for themselves. Okay. But guys, there's really not enough of them to do any to do any sorry serious damage. Okay. So what happens in step two is that these educated wealthy elites are going to have to team up with the lower classes in order to affect meaningful change. So they don't have the power on their own to overthrow the monarchy. So instead, they're going to have to ask for help from the lower classes, the serfs, poor people, all right, a much higher percentage of the population. Now, they will promise these lower classes genuine social and economic reform in order for their assistance. So they will promise them equality. They will promise an end to the serf system, okay? most of it just being promises, but they will need the lower classes to affect, affect a meaningful revolution, okay? So step three, the middle class, the upper middle class and the, the upper class men will, you know, they'll team up with these lower classes and they will work together to get a leader overthrown. So um, in France, the upper, um, upper class men will work with the lower classes in society to execute the French king. Louis XVI will have his head chopped off, okay? Um, this will happen all over the American Revolution, guys. Um, even though the leader, King George, does not get his head chopped off, the leader will be overthrown, okay? Um, the upper, upper classes of the American Americas will team up with the lower classes, all right? They will they will promise them no taxation of that representation. And once these two are on the same team, they will overthrow King George over in England, who really can't do anything about it because he's an ocean away. Okay. So guys, step four. After this revolution happens, um, all those economic and social promises that the upper classes promise the lower classes don't happen. All right. So people in the lower classes tend to be pissed off. 
And so what they're going to do is they're going to turn on the leadership. So the king of the king of France is killed. All right. And these upper upper class men are going to take over and try to rule. But they did not all the promises they made to the lower class for equality. All right. For social equality and economic reform. They don't go through. All right. It was all just a promise. That was a, that was a joke. So on step four, the lower classes are going to rise up and um, they're going to turn on this new leadership and it's going to get ugly. OK, step five, very, very ugly. Lower classes are going to seize power. And I think the French Revolution is a great example. Um, lower classes will seize power and they will continue to kill people. All right. So you guys have probably heard the French Revolution of this thing called the guillotine. It's right here. Um, lower classes will execute um, French nobility and then anyone who took over afterwards, those upper class rulers who promised equality and then never gave it to them. Okay. It gets very ugly. Entire streets of blood. Okay. Another revolution that we'll talk about in period four is the Russian Revolution. Okay. They would just line people up and shoot them. Okay. Different leaders are going to be backed by different groups and it's going to be very, very ugly. So guys, in step six, these lower classes turn on each other as well. Okay. These lower class groups will try to have their own sort of leaders and they will turn on each other and there will be more and more violence. And in step six, guys, this is probably the most radical and dangerous phase. This is when the streets are covered in blood. Hundreds of thousands of people are being killed. Um, this is when the most amount of, this is the, in France, it's called the reign of terror. Again, in Russia, this is when people are literally just being lined up and shot. Okay. Um, lots and lots of people are dying because of these revolutions. And this is kind of when revolutions become not so nice. All right. Step seven. This is when you're going to see a military leader who comes to power by promising an end to the violence. In France, that guy's going to be Napoleon, short little Napoleon, all right? And he will ultimately seize total power. So guys, if we looked at the beginning, we looked at step one, all those people who are trying to um, overthrow the absolutist king of France, this cycle is starting to repeat itself, guys, because in step seven, a new leader comes to power and he's gonna seize absolute and total power, okay? The same thing will happen in Russia after the Russian Revolution, okay? After leaders are killed, a new military leader is going to come to power by promising to stop the violence. His name will be Joseph Stalin and he will seize total power, okay? And finally, the eighth step to these cycles of revolution, lather, rinse, repeat. So if you just go ahead and you start back in the beginning, it's just going to be this constant cycle. Okay. Every one of these revolutions, except for the American revolution, is going to repeat these cycles over and over again. The Russians don't stop this cycle until about the 1990s, okay? The French don't really stop this cycle until about the 1940s, okay? These cycles of revolution, it's really hard to get out of it once your um, country has started re revolting in this cycle, okay? But guys, I want to leave you with one final thought. In our class next week, um, or our next class, we are going to start with one revolution. We're gonna start with the first one, the American Revolution. So I'm sure many of you guys have learned about the American Revolution in other classes, all right? You guys took Georgia history when you guys were in eighth grade, and you probably learned about Georgia's um, role in the American Revolution. But we're gonna talk about the American Revolution a little bit different in this class. So remember, this is world history, not American history. So we're gonna talk about it through the perspective of um, kind of a world, a worldly perspective. We're going to look at how the American Revolution fits in with all these other revolutions, okay, and what it means. And what you should know, guys, is that the American Revolution is going to be the first of the four revolutions. It will also be the only one that overcomes the cycle of revolution. And we've got to figure out why. 
Okay, why does America escape that cyclical movement around of lower classes overthrowing leaders, um, leaders dying in the streets, um, military leaders taking over? Okay, we got to figure out why. Okay, so that is my final thought for you. Okay, guys, so I know that was long and I know that that's a very general and broad introduction to you enlightenment and revolutions but you need to know all of this, all right? Those cycles of revolution are gonna come back and we're gonna talk about them over and over again in this class, okay? So if you missed class, send me an email and I will send you your missed work. And if not, I will see you guys in two days for our next class.